morning shows and, and current affairs programs, how do they deal differently with the whole diet scenario? Let's have a, a bit of a, a smattering. This is a smattering. These are edited versions. You can see the full versions uh, if you go to the RIOS website. But uh, let's just have a look at, a, at some clips of a few of the programs. Now, I've got a photograph for you. We want you to guess how old you think this woman is. Now, she looks like a teenager, but she's nearly 30 years of age, and she puts her youthful looks down to her diet of raw food. Today, nutritionist Joanna McMillan joins us now. So, uh, <laughs> that is amazing. I mean, she looks incredible. Can mm. a diet of raw food really keep you looking young? Well, look, there's certainly some really good aspects of having raw food. You know, I mean, I love that she's pictured there with her very, very green smoothie. It's a little more hardcore than the ones that we have here in the studio because... We love the hardcore ones we now. Do, oh, you do? We have a green you, juice every morning. We love it. Well, she claims that she has an entire lettuce plus spinach, plus it's literally just green veggies blitzed yeah. up, and that's what she drinks um, every single day. So, I mean, there are some key nutritional concerns here. The first, the obvious one is protein. You do get yeah. protein from some plant foods, but she'd have to be having some legumes, which, of course, have to be cooked. Um, you can eat them cold, but they have to be cooked first for you to eat them. If she was having dairy products, of course, she's getting very good quality protein there. If she eats eggs raw in her smoothies, then she'll get some protein. But certainly none of the foods that she's claiming are the bulk of her diet provide very much protein at all. Welcome back. Walk down the supermarket aisle and they're impossible to miss. Breads, cakes, pastas and biscuits all labelled gluten-free. Hundreds of thousands of Australians have cut gluten from their diet in the hope of losing weight. But some nutritionists believe they're doing more harm than good. Vanessa Cullen is one of many Australians ditching wheat, barley and rye and jumping on the gluten-free bandwagon. She radically altered her diet 12 months ago and says she noticed an immediate change. My tummy flattened down, I lost a whole lot of weight and I have the energy to get up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and get through the whole day no problem at all. Those boycotting gluten claim it's alleviating everything from tiredness to bloating and even clearing up spotty skin. They actually feel better because they're eating more fruits, they're eating more vegetables. They've actually ditched the white bread, white pasta which we know is nutritionally inferior and then put in this great healthy stuff, suddenly they feel healthier. It's not gluten's fault. Celiac Australia says the disease affects around 250,000 Australians, yet one million of us are on a gluten-restricted diet. Now, as a result, the industry will turn over more than $100 million next year, all because we're following the guidelines for a disease we don't even have. If you're trying to lose weight, the last place you should be going is to the cookie jar. Or well, so we thought. An American doctor has developed biscuits that help people lose two to three kilos a week. Frank Pangallo reports on the medically proven cookie diet. It sounds like a gimmick, eating sweet biscuits to lose heaps of weight. But the proof's in the pudding for American obesity expert Dr Sanford Siegel and his famous cookie diet. Why celebs are loving the cookie diet. Yes, you heard right. Hunger wrecks diets and I felt that we would have much better success with our patients if we had a better method of controlling hunger. And to do that the bariatric specialist came up with his own secret medical formula of ingredients which he then turned into a tasty flavoured cookie. What's in the biscuit uh, uh, that makes it work is a mixture of proteins and that's, that's my formula. Uh, it's a combination of certain for, uh, proteins uh, that absolutely control hunger. Well, just a smattering there of um, some of the, some of the uh, articles that have been on our TV screens. So, Joe, if I can start with you, how, how variable is the reporting on some of these uh, stories that we've saw, seen there? Oh, highly variable, isn't it? I think the first two were a lot more acceptable than the cookie diet there, the medically proven cookie diet, <laughs> <laughs> just add. Um, because uh, there's some reason there with, with a raw food diet to be concerned about protein, and they made that point. Um, and uh, with the second one, I think you know, it's quite widely accepted that uh, gluten intolerance is uh, something that a lot more people think they have than actually have a, a proper medical intolerance of gluten or celiac disease. And they made that point quite well, I think. But then that final example um, was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty
be awful, wasn't it? There's a doctor, there was an obesity expert. <laughs> yep, yep, there was. Um, wearing his white coat. Wearing his white coat. There's very little reference to what the medical proof actually was for the, the cookie diet. And I didn't think the cookies looked that great. No, um, they didn't look that exciting, I must <laughs> say. They cost $80 for one week's supply. But it does include postage. <laughs> well, thank goodness for that. And I looked up the ingredients. The main ingredient is sugar. The next ingredient is white flour, followed by vinegar, canola oil, milk solids, egg white, wholemeal flour, glycerol, oatmeal whey, rice flour, malt extract, salt, sodium acid, pyrophosphate, bicarb soda, corn flour, calcium phosphate, buckwheat flour, spelt flour, oat bran, wheat bran, molasses, cinnamon and salt. So the grains that he says, that they're all in the order they come, the buckwheat and the spelt and the oat and the wheat bran all come under the carb soda. So, you know, if you've made biscuits, you only use a bit of that, so there's not much of them there. Um, he also claimed on his website that he has used this diet on over $500,000, oh, 500,000, sorry, of his own patients in 37 years, and I worked out if he works a 42-hour week, that means he spends just nine minutes with each of his <laughs> patients. So, I mean, it really is just um, a bit of a nonsense. And I think anyone who believes it deserves to lose their money. <laughs> <laughs> each of the things we saw today, though, has uh, had experts in there. We yeah. had nutritionists, we had a doctor. So, um, well, tell us, you know, how much can we believe a nutritionist or a dietitian that is put up there, or a doctor uh, for that matter? It's very difficult. I'm always being um, castigated by my colleagues because I've always been called a nutritionist. But when I started working in the mid 1960s, um, I worked in public health, and public health people who'd done the, the science degree and then the postgraduate nutrition and dietetics stuff, we had to be called nutritionists. We actually got paid a bit more than the dietitians who all worked in hospitals in mm. those days. I subsequently became the first dietitian who ever worked in private practice, and now, there, of course, there are lots of them. Um, but because I was always known as a nutritionist, I continued in that vein. The people who do nutrition research at CSIRO and various universities are all called nutritionists. Dietitians tend to work with individuals on their particular diet. Um, but it is difficult because people can call themselves either with there's no legal requirement not to. If you want to know if somebody is a genuine dietitian, and they have to be a genuine dietitian for any medical funds to pay out um, fees for having seen the dietitian, you can go to the Dietitians of Australia website and they have a list of all their accredited dietitians. Uh, the Nutrition Society of Australia also has a list of the accredited nutritionists and they're, mm. they're all the people who are sort of generally doing research or include some of the public health people. But it is very difficult because, I mean, people ring me up all the time and say, uh, what course do you recommend? I want to be a nutritionist. And I say, well, you've got to go to university first and do biochemistry and physiology and all those sort of things, and then you do a master's these days. And they say, oh, no, I want to go to university. I just, you know, just want a, a short course, just a few weeks. <laughs> and I think, well, you can't become a doctor in a few weeks and you can't become a genuine nutritionist in a few weeks either. But I think there's such a, a problem, and I keep seeing people call nutritionists and if they're in America, of course, they buy their nutrition qualifications. It's quite easy to buy them. I actually bought some for my old English sheepdog, just to show <laughs> how easy it was. And it only cost me 150 US dollars. And she then became a, a, a nutrition consultant and got the thing to go on the wall. And she got special discounts on hair analysis, which I was very tempted to send in. She had, <laughs> she had a lot of hair. Um, but remember on the Catalyst program, sorry, ABC, but they had a, a nutritionist. He had one of those sort of things that you just buy. Mm -hmm. I was horrible enough to think that when he had his dyed blonde hair and fake tan and gold chains around his neck and a, a sort of his shirt open nearly to his navel that he probably wasn't a genuine nutritionist. <laughs> but that just shows I'm old fashioned. <laughs> but look, you, you can actually find out about people and there's a site called Quack, Quack Watch that uh, lists some of the shonky American people. Um, and there, is the, uh, there are some sceptic sites that you can look up mm. as well. But it, it is, I think it's very confusing for the public. Mm. Um, Joanna McMillan on there is a genuine dietitian nutritionist and I think the gluten person was too. Well, let, let's talk about that because they were basically examples from morning shows. Um, now, on the same level, we've got the morning shows that I think we're all familiar with that have the infomercials 
uh, that seem to be riddled with diet type products or uh, pushing programs. So is there a difference between those? Between the sort of you know article, not article, but uh, uh, segment you'd see on a, a morning program, a breakfast program, and then one of those infomercial type segments. Well, I think there really is, and when people are selling something on the program, that makes you somewhat suspicious. Mm. Um, some programs they will only have have people on if they are, if they have a product to sell, and those people actually sometimes pay to go on the program. Mm. So that's a problem. Uh, it wasn't a problem with those first two segments. I don't know if Dr Cookie paid to go on. I don't think he did. He was probably just... It's just seen as entertainment. Mm. And I think it's a bit of a pity when a, a topic that really should have some seriousness to it is seen just as entertainment and um, just a method for selling things. Mm. And again, we have no regulation, Joe, I think. Well, well effectively no yeah, regulation. Yeah, I mean, with those morning shows, it's it's very hard to tell where the show ends and the advertising starts, really, isn't it? Mm. They're often showing you how to cook something as if it was a cooking show, but then using a very reasonably priced, attractive set of pans to do it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it strikes me from the regulations that you'd have to complain to two different sets of people, because that advertorial uh, kind of side of things, you have to complain to the advertising authorities. If it's current affairs and news, then you complain to the, uh, the commercial TV mm. regulator. So, I, I mean, the only way you could you could get around it, I suppose, is by complaining to both if you can't figure out whether it's a This is, I guess, assuming you want to do something. I think most of us want to just know which ones we can believe. Yep. Don't trust any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably well, the only way to go. Product placement is important too. I mean, for 10 years I did a, a segment on Burke's Backyard. There was never a week that people didn't want me to show their product and offered me a lot of money, none of which I ever took. And in fact, to be fair to that program, they wouldn't take any money from people. But they were even good things, like if you mention apples on four cons um, consecutive programs, we'll give you money that was sort of like 50 times as much as I got paid for doing the segment. Um, and people always wanted their brand of, of mm. anything. I don't try, I try to avoid branded things, and so I would have a bottle of olive oil that I'd pull all the labels off, you know, and sort of if I was using olive oil, if yes. I was cooking something. And it was actually quite difficult. And people complained bitterly, you used olive oil and you didn't show a brand. We will give you X dollars if you show our brand. Mm. It's, it's persistent at them. And so I think most people just say, well, okay, why not? Um, as long as it still fits in with what they're saying. Lots yeah, of, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I resisted, but it was hard work. Now, let's take a look at the role of the expert then, because as you can see, we've had experts in these examples that we've shown you, um, and it's always hard to know. We've got the, the, uh, the qualifications, perhaps possibly on the first two, that seem to be okay. But how do we know then that none of those have a conflict of interest, as Rosemary's saying? I think most of us would agree she has... Um, uh, enormous credentials, but when you're on those programs, how do we know that there's no conflict of interest that's going on behind the scenes? How do we know? Well, that is a tricky one. Um, in terms of individuals, then it's probably always best to just go for the, the Google approach and to, to have a look. If they're known for doing this kind of you know, misinformation or selling products, there might be something about it on the net. But it is really quite hard to tell at face value. The kind of things that we use at the centre to know whether people are uh, genuine experts or not are probably going to be quite difficult to apply to somebody being shown very quickly on TV because we look at things like the institution they come from, um, their publication record, mm. uh, their reputation among their peers, that kind of thing. But if, if it's happening so quickly, that's going to be quite difficult to tell. But if, you, if they can say they're a professor of such and such from a, the name of a university that you recognise, that's probably better than you know, the cookie diet guy, for example, there, who's clearly spooking your product. Now, just in case you thought there was any validity in the, the cookie diet at all, can I blow your mind by saying that the scientific researcher who was used in that actually owned the product as, as well? Um, but we are not to, to know that. So when it comes to the, the journalists doing this, how responsible is that reporting? And how, what, I guess what onus do they have in... In, in checking those things out, Rosemary? I think they should check them out. It's actually quite easy to do. I mean, if I can just hark back to that Catalyst program, 
I, within five minutes, I found that all four of their experts were people who had co-written a book um, and that they actually had products that they sold, having sort of told everyone that it was nothing to do with cholesterol, don't worry about your cholesterol, they all sell cholesterol-lowering products. Um, it took me five minutes to find that out. So the internet is actually quite a boon to sort of look mm. up, do they have a website and does that website have a shop and a cart and you can sort of look at the, look at the products and also look at the prices. Um, some of these people have ridiculous prices on the product. Um, I mean, I actually think that 80, uh, was it, um, 80 dollars for your week's cookies is quite a bit. Um, <laughs> but look at some of the supplements and you look at people's vitamins. An expensive vitamin is still the same product as a cheap vitamin. Um, and yet some people are charging 50, 60, 70 dollars. You look at products where they're selling wonder juices that contain some magic berry, usually from South America. Um, and you look at the product and you discover the product is basically apple juice with only a tiny bit of this other juice because it's so bitter that you don't want to put too much. And it's $60 a litre. Mm. Um, so you, that should make people suspicious. Is there anything wrong, though, if you think you've got something that will make a difference in making some money out of it? Well, probably not. But, you know, I mean, do you really think it'll... Well, I think people actually do get convinced by their pro the products they're selling. They're quite mm. convinced. I mean, the people who are selling um, some of those supplement brands um, really get to believe that if people will take their herbal supplement, that they will have super health. And often they take it themselves and they feel better. And frankly, if you believe in things, they usually work. I think we might just have the, the final video to show you a couple more um, examples of whether or not, uh, or how experts are used and, and, and what role they play. Can we just play this? Uh, one of these is... Um, um, uh, it's on the product Garcinia Cambogia, and one is from the American daytime TV show Dr. Oz, the other from a recent Today Tonight episode. Thank you. From African mango to green coffee, it's the most talked about topic. Everybody wants to know what's the newest, fastest fat buster. You've been stopping me on the street, emailing me, even my family is asking the same question. How can I burn fat without spending every waking moment exercising and dieting? I just don't have any time to put in more effort. Well, thanks to brand new scientific research, I can tell you about a revolutionary fat buster. You're hearing it here first. It's called Garcinia cambogia, a pumpkin-shaped fruit that grows in Southeast Asia and India. And it just might be the most exciting breakthrough in natural weight loss to date. Revolutionary new research says it could be the magic ingredient that lets you lose weight without diet or exercise. Dr. Harry Proust is at the forefront of the research. The ideal weight loss program is one in which you lose fat and you retain your muscle or even build it. With Garcinia, we can make that happen. Garcinia is an exceptionally effective fat buster. It uh, inhibits the production of fat in the body, and when the body's not making fat, it's burning fat. Could Garcinia Cambogia be the fat busting breakthrough you've been waiting for? The newest, fastest fat buster, and one of the least expensive too, is Garcinia Cambogia extract. I know it's a mouthful. I want you to write it down. Garcinia Cambogia, because it may be the simple solution you've been looking for to bust your body fat for good. Dr. Julie Chen, a California internist with a fellowship training in integrative medicine, is here with more on this discovery. So educate us a bit about Garcinia Cambogia. What makes it so special? Well, you know, there's a lot of expensive supplements out there for weight loss. And what I love about this product is once it's one of the most least expensive out there for people to use. And it's actually been seen in studies to help increase weight loss by two to three times what people would naturally lose with just diet and exercise alone. And they've been able to isolate this compound from the rind of the fruit mm -hmm. and made it into a capsule for people to take more easily. And when TV medico Mehmet Oz declared Garcinia Cambogia the holy grail of weight loss, demand almost outstripped global supply. It's a little pumpkin-like fruit and it's very small, it's about the size of a tomato and it has an active component in it called HCA. 
Hydroxycerulic acid. That is what has the fat burning component. Nutritionist Kimberly Douglas has put dozens of her clients onto Garcinia Cambogia with outstanding results. It's great for burning abdominal wall fat. So people usually lose on average about three to four kilo in a month when they're on it. I have no commercial connection with this whatsoever, except that I buy it. And I tell you what, it's been the best investment I've ever made. It also drops cholesterol. It helps the body process cholesterol through the liver. It also helps the brain increase serotonin levels. It also helps the metabolism burn fat and it also helps with sleep. But a warning, not all Garcinia Cambogia on the market is the same or authentic. The secret is that magic ingredient. There have been double blind clinical trials printed now approving that the HCA works, but it must be at a 60 to 70 percent ratio in the formula. There you go. Now, uh, today, tonight, in that last episode, you heard Kimberly Douglas, the nutritionist there, say uh, that uh, there have been trials that prove that this works. Rosemary, is Garcinia Cambogia? The miracle that we're told it is? Well, I've just finished writing a chapter for an international textbook on all these sort of topics, so I have looked it all up. I wish she actually had known that it was hydroxy citric acid. She didn't quite get the, the term right. would have made me believe her a bit more. Um, this really is a problem. I mean, Dr Oz is very, very popular in America. Um, he's actually distinguished himself by being three times awarded the Pegasus Awards from the James Randi Foundation, they look at the paranormal and all these things and whether it's genuine, for promoting faith, he got the award for promoting faith healing, energy medicine and other quack theories that have no scientific basis. <laughs> He's the only person who's uh, got it three times. Um, <laughs> but what concerns me with that is that they're actually making claims that when you look up the studies simply are not true. Now when I looked up Dr Harry Preuss, who's for whom the Garcinia Cambogia obviously hadn't worked. I didn't mean to be awful. But <laughs> <laughs> um, he actually works for a group that promotes dietary supplements and spend most of their time actually complaining about any legislation that prohibits people making whatever health claim they want. So that is a bit of a, a problem. Um, he actually cites references and when you actually look up the paper, and I'm presuming that he thinks you won't look up the paper, when you look up the paper it says exactly the opposite. So he says this study shows something and you look up the paper and it said it was found that the, the uh, Garcinia Cambogia had no effect whatsoever. Um, another one of the studies actually looked at um, 86 people and they found not only did they not have any weight loss, uh, when compared with the placebo. There was no significant change in their body fat, their triglycerides, their, their cholesterol levels, their antioxidants, a whole range of other things. Absolutely no difference. Um, Dr Julie Chen, who said the thing was very cheap, I was somewhat alarmed when I looked up her claims because she says that Garcinia Cambogia moves fat and changes it into glycogen. Now that's not biochemically possible. <laughs> um, and so I really do have problems when these people, who have genuine degrees, by the way, um, well, I wasn't quite too sure about Rich, Rich, Rich Schickenbach because he's involved in a lot of um, fraudulent um, legal cases in the US, so I'll leave him to that. But they do have genuine qualifications and yet they quote things and when you look them up, they're actually wrong. So I get quite concerned about that, but they're selling a product and that should be the red flag. They're trying to sell you a product, they're telling you that theirs is cheaper um, and it, it isn't. Mm. And if you look up the other uh, nutritionist, uh, she does some strange things that nutritionists wouldn't do as well. Uh, Joe, can I bring you into this though? Because I mean, mm. Rosemary's talking about experts who have real degrees. She's talking about journals uh, that we may or may not look into, but there are some legitimate journals. But then I don't know how many of you would know whether a journal quoted is a legitimate one or not. I don't think I would. So if Rosemary looks and finds these things, how does the average person who's just reading an article can determine if we said earlier that, you know, if you're quoting an article, well, that might be good? It's quite difficult because scientists are just people and they're subject to corruption and being on the take as any other group of people. 
so people can be have a genuine degree, like this woman here, but has probably been offered quite a lot of money to appear there um, in a white coat, looking very sciencey, uh, you know. Um, and the, the same is true with journals. It's very, it can be very hard to judge. There's a huge array of different journals yeah. out there, and they're of very varying qualities. Um, there are some which are kind of known for their reliability, um, but there are plenty out there that are, um, you know, their business model is to get people to pay to submit articles, um, so they are not too careful about vetting those articles before they go ahead and publish, because that's how they're, they're making their money. So it, it's a difficult one for, for sort of people from the public to judge, um, and also often to find the research, because a lot of that research is not freely available to the public. So even if you went out of your way to look up that particular journal article, you might find that you couldn't read it because it's behind a paywall, or they're going to charge you $50 for the, for the article. Mm. Um, but doesn't that give us, you know, that makes us feel a little bit better about research often. I mean, I think, was it Kimberly Douglas again said, oh, and this research has been printed or yeah, something yeah. and is available. It makes she said it sound printed, legitimate. not published, and some of the research those people quote I also found was not available. They call it a journal, but it's only available on their website. You can't actually look up the journal. Mm -hmm. If you go look at the journal, it's not there. Um, so that, that would raise suspicions. But when I was writing my chapter, it, it took me about six weeks to write my chapter on all these sort of things. And that, so it took me a long time to sort of to look for all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, it is available and you can look up these journals that you pay to have your paper in. They solicit people too. I probably get um, probably half a dozen requests a week from journals uh, on topics in which I have no expertise, wanting, I mean scientific journals, wanting me to submit a paper and pay for the privilege. Can Many I, thousands of dollars I might add. We're, we're talking about, I, I guess, active, um, actively trying to deceive people in these ways possibly, but we also have a lot of variation between scientific opinion, don't we? Absolutely. So is that also adding to the confusion about oh, a lot of this stuff? It really does. And very often the media release is quite different um, from what the article actually says. Or the article looks at only one aspect. Um, I mean, just last week we had articles saying there was nothing wrong with saturated fat. But when you look at the methodology and you read the article carefully, you find some problems. And yet it wasn't a new study. And in fact, I think I spent several days doing interviews from that. And people said, oh, there's a new study. I said, it's a reanalysis of old studies and it's been done in a particular way. Mm. Um, but what I think we could learn from that was that trying to judge a diet, any diet, on the basis of one aspect, like one nutrient. If you're going to talk about saturated fat, you get the same amount of saturated fat in a tablespoon of lard or a, a handful of cashews or... Um, a piece of steak or a small custard tart. But, I mean, we wouldn't consider them equal in any other way, but they just happen to have one, one thing the same. So trying to um, talk about a diet, the same with all the low-carb diets. I always say you're talking about lollipops or legumes, um, jelly beans or rolled oats. I mean, they're all carbohydrate, but they're obviously different. So I think it is very awkward when a lot of scientists talk in terms of nutrients, and what we did when we formulated the last set of dietary guidelines, which took us four years to put together, we decided that dietary guidelines should be in terms of foods, not nutrients. Because if you talk about nutrients, you've got the problem, you mm. know, is it, is it oats or is it jelly beans? And there, but there you're highlighting, aren't you, too, that yeah. the scientific uh, method and that changes over the years and has done so in the 40 years you've been looking at this. Well, we were criticised for, for talking in terms of foods because the food industry want to talk in terms of nutrients because mm. then they can advertise a highly sugared cereal and say it's got a lot of vitamins. Yeah. It's all very well for me to look at the vitamins and say that in 50 years of work, of, apart from some chronic alcoholics who eat no food, I've never seen anyone deficient in the three vitamins they stick in the cocoa pops. <laughs> um, it really is um, a bit of a... They like nutrients because it enables them to give these sort of fortified foods um, mm. for which they can charge an awful lot for sugar. 